So I think we can we can get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining. My name is Trevor Tim. I'm the executive director here at Freedom of the Press Foundation, and welcome to our inaugural uh, members only uh, exclusive talk. Uh, we're going to be doing these for our uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation members fairly regularly over the next year. And we are uh, so privileged and honored to have uh, actually one of our co-founders um, and the legendary Pentagon Papers whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, with us today, who's coming uh, live from Berkeley, California. And uh, it's going to be an hour where we can talk about leaks, where we can talk about government secrecy, we can talk about press freedom. Uh, today is World Press Freedom Day, after all. And uh, we get to have the privilege of, of getting Dan's unique uh, experience and perspective on on all current events. Um, before we start, uh, it, you know this event is for members, so you have uh, already graciously donated to Freedom of the Press Foundation. So thank you so much. Please pass along um, uh, our website to anybody who you think would like to join these events in the future. Um, we're hopefully going to be able to put this one up online uh, in a couple of weeks, um, but uh, many of them might not go online at all. So. Um, definitely let your friends and family know. Uh, but so without further ado, uh, ado uh, Dan, uh, welcome and thank you so much for doing this. I, you know, today is, uh, today of all days, it's very interesting to, to have you on because um, as you and probably everybody saw um, late last night, one of the most significant leaks in, in recent history um, has occurred. Politico published an, unpub uh, an unpublished Supreme Court opinion um, uh, written by Justice Alito, um, which purports to potentially overturn Roe v. Wade and has caused a, a firestorm uh, in the political world and around the country. And so I would love to just get your general thoughts on, um, on the significance of this leak and, and the significance of leaks in general to democracy. Well, thank you. First, uh, let me welcome as a, as a board member along with you, Trevor, the, the people who are listening to this, uh, especially I mean, the small funders representing, you know, a large, uh, I hope, potentially growing and large mass of supporters of this uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation. So I'm, I'm really glad to be addressing you. Um, on this, uh, Trevor, it occurs to me, uh, first, you have the advantage of being on the East Coast. I think you have learned, heard more about this than I have yet. I, I was reading the press edition of the, the West Coast edition of the New York Times now. It's not in there. And so I'm not as up on the controversy as you are probably. But in, uh, and I, I'm happy to comment, give you my initial reactions to it. Uh, it appears to be an unprecedented leak uh, of, an, of a total opinion. And uh, uh, even though it's a uh, um, draft opinion, and, uh, justices can change their position up until the last moment till it's published and that is supposed to be in late June so we have some real time here for uh, public discussion of it and let me ask this uh, I I'm talking now to Trevor you're as um, knowledgeable about the uh, the laws on information and leaking and everything as I am, and I put it that way because that's the one part of the law that I am conversant with, literally, uh, having been a defendant. So I come, the first defendant actually, under the Espionage Act. So I come to this from the point of view, not of a lawyer, but of a defendant and a whistleblower. And since you're a lawyer and a, a total supporter of whistleblowers, I want to ask you, what's your reaction to uh, the situation? Well, you know what, there, there is, you know, with your case, there is this interesting parallel here. Um, obviously, your uh, case involved the Pentagon Papers, the top secret study that was classified by the United States government, uh, and they were able to charge you under the Espionage Act before your, your case was dismissed for, for misconduct. But correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they also charged you under... 18 U.S.C. 641, uh, which is the law around theft of government property. Um, and, and conspiracy also, conspiracy to defraud the government, defraud them of their supposedly legal or though not supported uh, in explicit law, uh, right to classify information. And I was frustrating that. Uh, <laughs> certainly I didn't. I, I really was very 
struck when I found myself I was uh, charged with defrauding because I thought what I'm doing is revealing truth here about lies and criminality. But apparently the governments, as I say, unsupported by law, but their function of keeping secrets, even about lies and crimes and aggression, uh, is something that they are entitled to protect. And uh, that's the us I had gone against. So we have uh, perhaps conspiracy, if there's more than one person involved, uh, could be charged here. And as you say, the uh, theft conversion. And when you say uh, that they were able to use the Espionage Act, that was an experiment in my case. It never had been used for that on the assumption that it was unconstitutional under the First Amendment, that to hold a criminal to reveal any secret that some government official had stamped private person, well, classified, confidential secret, top secret, uh, was a crime and uh, could be prosecuted Under the Espionage Act, which had for, for, uh, earlier than that had been used only against spies who had given information in secret to a foreign power, especially an enemy in time of war. And so it was an experiment to see if they could use the Espionage Act against me. The charges were dismissed because of government criminality against me. So that didn't uh, determine uh, the uh, judicial basis of that. And really, there wasn't another case for uh, years after that, more than a decade. The Supreme Court, as you know, Trevor, has never addressed the constitutionality of that application of the Espionage Act to this day, although there have been, especially since Obama, an increasing number of cases now. But they've all been settled uh, either by uh, copying a plea by, by a deal to avoid being charged even greater charges. People have gone along with that even when they didn't feel they, uh, they should but they couldn't afford to pursue the case anymore. And in the, in the I, I only know of one case that was actually appealed up to the Supreme Court, the Morrison case, where they denied, uh, they didn't uh, hear it. There may have been another by now, I'm not sure, do you know? But anyway, I am just want to make the point that the constitutionality of this prosecution has not been even addressed by the Supreme Court, let alone settled. And I have the impression the defendant here talking to lawyers that in my day 50 years ago in 1971 73 uh, a supreme court very well might have or would have even likely uh, denied constitutionality of this use of the espionage act that's far from the case today and with the new supreme court i wouldn't want to count on it at all i think the odds would be against me of course this applies to julian assange which we'll probably come back to uh, who would be the first journalist, if he's extradited, to be prosecuted under this. But anyway, I asked you a question, Trevor, and I've now <laughs> given you a chance to, to think no, about no, your answer, no, so I, go ahead. <laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, the reason I brought up um, USC 641 is because, you know, there are there is a lot of outrage over this leak from especially uh, right-wing circles um, uh, this morning. Um, yet, even uh, with everybody claiming that this is a, uh, you know, breach of, of confidentiality, we've never seen, not a lot of people can point to a law in which this legal, this leaker potentially broke, uh, because, of course, Supreme Court opinions aren't classified, um, and the uh, Supreme Court justices or clerks don't sign, um, you know, large secrecy agreements like national security officials do. And so the one statute some people have pointed to is, is this stolen government property statute. Now, this also brings up First Amendment concerns, given that, um, it, you know, it was also something that you were charged with. And many people think that information is not necessarily property. And so curious if, if this came up in your case and, and, and whether, um, it, you know, you had given any thought to, to whether it's, you know, a First Amendment violation uh, to be gagging people with that statute. 